<clears throat> Tonight uh, we have a woman who has spent incredible hours and days and weeks in the, in the historical next door doing uh, an incredible job of inventorying what is there. And beyond that, she has great ideas for what we might do in the future with the historical. So I present to you Mary Ellen Lepionka. Thank you very much. So uh, for about two years now, Tom uh, O'Keefe and I have been working in the, in the firehouse on Mondays uh, and l looking at the artifacts and trying to make an inventory or a list of everything that's in there. Uh, Tom has been uh, heroically guarding all that material for a long time, uh, but it hasn't been properly curated in more than in at least 30 years or about 30 years. Um, and um, I started this, uh, I just was looking for Native American artifacts and was uh, for a book I'm writing uh, and was making the rounds of all the museums and historical societies to see their collections. And when, and Tom let me see the collection that's there. Uh, and when I asked to see the catalog, he said there wasn't one. And I, I offered to help him make an inventory. And so here we are two years later uh, and a lot of, uh, a lot of, we've learned a lot of what's in there and wanted to share that with you. What we found in there comes into these 15 categories. And I'd like to just show you a couple of examples from each category to give you an idea. And it's really just a sampling. There's much more in there than you could, than you could imagine. I, I don't want to actually read that list, um, but I'm sorry if it's too small in the back to read, is it? No? Okay. Uh, so I, I'm just sharing a few of the things that I regard as, the, as your greatest treasures. First of all, there are old books, uh, all in various degrees of relevance and uh, condition. In an old safe on the first floor, we found the letter book of Thomas Saville, written in 1804, between 1804 and 1812. This is more than 200 years old. Uh, and the book is literally crumbling if you look at it. So um, I photographed each page, wrapped it in cotton, and put it in a box. Uh, but it needs to go somewhere where there's archival storage. And um, the committee that is formed on behalf of the uh, Historical Society and the museum has made an arrangement with the Cape Ann Museum to take some of the things uh, that um, are endangered and that are rare and unique uh, until something can be done to help the firehouse be more of a museum and then they could all come back. Uh, so I have, we haven't sent over this book yet but um, another book has gone over. This Thomas Saville, uh, he was, uh, his brother James, I'm, I'm going to get off on a tangent now so I better not get <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, he inventoried uh, in his letter book everywhere he, where he went. He kept a record of it. Uh, so he indexed his letters in Saville, from Barcelona, from Cadiz, B Lisbon, Malta, Gibraltar, Charleston. Uh, and he sent versions of the same letter on several ships in case one of them sunk. Uh, and uh, or you know you might get into a port and get stuck in quarantine because there's plague there or yellow fever uh, or you're in a port that's now you're in danger of being seized in a French blockade uh, because of course this is, is uh, during the Napoleonic Wars so uh, uh, it, it, this kind of document is just priceless for research and uh, needs to be transcribed and and made available to people outside of Anasquam. And there are, there are other documents like this. There are old rate books. This book gives the prices of commodities and world trade in 1821. <coughs> this is a letter book belonging to Henry C. Wright. You may have, may have heard about this. He was a famous American abolitionist. And these are all letters that were written to him in the 1840s by leaders in Ireland and in Scotland about how to start an anti-slavery society. From my research, Anasquam actually was among the first, if not the first community in 
New England to have an anti-slavery society. Uh, and the records of the, of the society are, are in the Anasquam. Um, this letter book, which is, which is now in the Cape Ann Museum for safekeeping, uh, it has advice about uh, having William Lloyd Garrison come over, uh, having uh, Frederick Douglass come to give a talk, and so on. Um, I came to your museum through the Leonard and Saville families. Uh, and uh, the anti-slavery society here, the, the little, I mean, I can't really read everything that I come across while making the list, but I did see that um, the, the members of the group uh, had voted to uh, pool their money and buy all the slaves of their neighbors in order to set them free. This was going to be their, an idealistic goal for the society to do. I don't know what, what, whatever happened there, but... It will be fun. It would be fun to find out. This writing on the right um, is because you, you, one letter is horizontal and the other letter is vertical, and this had to do with so you had to turn the page in order to read the next letter, um, and this was to conserve paper was very rare and very expensive in the 1830s. Um, this is. Uh, a few more examples of some of the handwritten documents that I've come across that are uh, that you know need to be they're historically significant and they need to be archivally uh, stored. Transcriptions need to be made so that future generations can know what these uh, people said, what the documents are. They're they're very you know very interesting. There are windows on the, the past, and you, you and everybody else deserves to see them. And the humanity of the details is kind of compelling. Uh, this dressmaker, for example, she made a special trip to the docks in Charlestown in order to buy lace and ribbon off of a boat for one of her clients. She has c notes on what colors each of her clients wants uh, and, uh, you know, what their tastes are, and the dates for when she's supposed to have fittings and so on. Um, and her name isn't in it, so we don't know who she is. Maybe we'll find out. This uh, minutes of the Anasquam Reading Circle from the 1870s, this was a, a reading group and they wrote down everything that they read and what they thought of it. So, uh, for example, you find out they read Washington Irving's stories and Robert Southey's poems and Elihu Burritt's articles about the Irish potato famine and things like that. So it's very interesting and beautiful handwriting to see what they thought about the books they read. And half of them are books that you probably haven't even heard of. <laughs> The museum is full of ephemera, lots of social, personal, and political, including postcards, greeting cards, dance cards, advertising cards, devotional cards, sympathy cards, and so on. And these are scattered all over the museum. And some of these will prove to be very rare, such as these Victorian trade cards. Sorting out the ephemera and figuring out how to protect and display them would make a good project. Uh, because all the paper and fabric items in the firehouse are all endangered because the building is damp and has no climate control. It's unheated in winter. These are four of my favorite advertising cards. You have Adam's Tutti Frutti Gum on the top left. Country Cousin Tobacco on the top right. And I like that he's lighting his her cigarette with his cigarette. This has to be you know, an early effort, one of the earliest efforts of the tobacco industry to make smoking sexy. And then there's Warner's Safe Yeast. The boy is using it as a telescope to watch Halley's Comet. The last time Halley's Comet was around was 1907, and that's what this uh, advertising card refers to. Then there's this uh, a racist uh, uh, advertisement for Osborne's Mince Pies. The cook says to her children, I make that pie for aristocrats. Osborne's mince pie, too rich for you. There are, there are dozens of these, and they, 
The museum's ephemera also includes a large collection of vintage postcards. Some of them are made from uh, Martha Harvey plates and George Harvey sketches. Um, and they need to be removed from their old binders and cataloged and re remounted. And as you may know, the, the museum has a, a collection of Martha Harvey's large format photographic equipment and some of her glass plates. There are also 350 Martha Harvey glass plates being stored in the Cape Ann Museum. <clears throat> There are the one they may not know is that there are still hundreds of glass plates in the museum by other photographers, including N. Dyer, P. Lufkin, T. Clark, and E. D. Mellon, all of whom were photographing here in Anasquam in the 1880s, 1890s, and between 1900 and, say, 1910. And some of them are just absolutely beautiful. Martha Harvey's Anasquam photographs included subjects uh, and scenes that were all painted by Winslow Homer when he lived here. This scene, for example, one, man, one of these men's is a Mr. Ingersoll, and I've forgotten the other man's name, but uh, this, was, this was a picture that uh, Winslow used in one of his paintings. Many local and regional scenes of the 1870s by Martha Harvey, and you may recognize the place that's on the left. And that's Mother Anne, I believe, on the right, that rock. Can you speak up a little louder? Oh, I'm sorry, I will. <coughs> <coughs> the uh, glass plates uh, all need to be cleaned. Um, the emulsions are dried out and are starting to chip. Um, they need archival storage, and there are many boxes and binders of negatives and prints from the plates uh, that need to be sorted out. That collection's never been really properly cataloged. It has national value and shouldn't be kept here unless it's going to be cared for properly. <clears throat> the museum also has stereopticon slides and viewers and many other vintage photos of local scenes and houses of people, most of which are not identified. And it would be fun to have a photo fest in which you all help to try to identify who the subjects are and where the houses are that are in some of these beautiful old photographs. For example, here's a carriage on the old Anasquam Bridge, a sleigh, in the winter, passing uh, Sergeant's store. This is a resident on Leonard Street in the 1890s. Is that who it is? Oh, let's write that down. <laughs> and here's a, a visit from a traveling salesman. These are just a couple of examples that I picked. Uh, this is the Davis family and friends in front of the Davis store, sorting and identifying and displaying the vintage photographs as a project best undertaken by, by, village, by the village residents, by you. The museum also owns vintage paintings. Here's Thomas Pulsifer Jr. on the left, uh, and he has some scratches uh, and needs to be cleaned. Esther Lane Woodbury, 1770 to 1850, was the daughter of Captain Gideon Lane. Uh, her husband, Asa, was the owner of the largest fishing fleet in Gloucester at that time. Uh, there are large photo montages of vessels and houses that also need to be remounted and reframed. They start, they've wrinkled and fallen off of their backings uh, or mats and so on. So the, this painting is by George Harvey, and you can see how the canvas is becoming fly-specked and smudged. The museum also has wood carvings and sketches by him. Other wood carvings include the hulls of vessels, which at one time was very popular uh, to do, and these birds, a pigeon and a quail, handcrafted by Alexander Pope, Jr., who was a famous 19th century artist. They need to be cleaned and repaired. 
there's a lot of genealogical material in the museum, and this seems to be the greatest use. People contact uh, Tom for information about their ancestors, um, and he has tried to respond to their requests, but quite often the information can't be found. It hasn't been cataloged, and it's scattered all over. There are genealogical manuscripts, family scrapbooks, diplomas, personal letters, unidentified family portraits, including a number of daguerreotypes and tintypes. And there's one filing cabinet organized alphabetically by family surnames. And these things all need to be brought together in some systematic way in a space where people can go in and sit down and look and find uh, where their houses and find their ancestors and actually learn something about them at some point. Now you could at some point have an educational program in the library and it could be open more often for people to have access. <clears throat> I started a, uh, a surname index. This is just a random sample of some of the names. So far I have 236 names. And all the genealogy files uh, could be put into acid-free folders and filed alphabetically by surname. And all the, um, the vertical file data could be labeled and filed alphabetically by topic. There's every imaginable topic relating to Anna Squam's history uh, in there, all in fairly sc scattered papers. <clears throat> Other items relating to genealogy include this name quilt. It was a uh, charity fundraiser conducted by the Anasquam Sewing Circle in which people paid to have their names written on one of the triangles in the quilt. Now, uh, Tom tells me there are two of these and that one is in the village church. There's a very extensive but ext uh, you know, scattered collection of information on Anasquam real estate in the firehouse uh, and the history of the old houses here. This is a floor plan of the first floor of the Lingard house called The Pines. It's on Washington Street. You may know it. This is just an example. There's a trunk, a filing cabinet, and a map cabinet, and a cupboard all full of old, drawer, old maps, drawings of houses and roads, uh, rolls, blueprints, geographical surveys, and development plans. Um, they tell the history of the development of Anasquam as a community, and they need to be brought together in some coherent way. My favorite are all the old nautical maps. Um, the old sea captains took these charts and pasted them onto canvas and then rolled them up and tied them with ribbon to carry shipboard. Uh, and they're cracked with age and salt spray, which you can smell on them. And they're also annotated with the ship captain's uh, notes. <clears throat> For example, uh, <clears throat> on the way to San Francisco or to Halifax. <clears throat> this is Blunt's uh, 18... 26 chart of the of what was called the Western Ocean, which is the Atlantic. And the sea captain who used it marked where all its mistakes are. Red X, do not go there. <laughs> and the museum also has nautical objects like this sextant, which was used by the sea captains Gideon and Oliver Lane. And also has some of the material that those sea captains brought back from their voyages. There's uh, porcelain, lacquer work, scrimshaws, tortoise shell combs, and other exotic objects. They're displayed in old uh, Victorian vitrines or glass cases that all need to be redone and redecorated inside and out. <clears throat> This uh, anonymous Union, Union soldier's hat and a revolutionary era um, powder horn are rotting on the bottom of a bookcase, on the bottom shelf of a bookcase. Along with his leather backpack, his canteen, and his cartridge case, and so far there's no record as to who he was. There are letters home from a surgeon who practiced on Civil War battlefields, and scrapbooks from that period, also musket balls from the Revolutionary War, and memorabilia 
and photographs of local people who served in World War I. And remembering your veterans properly would make a great project for anybody interested in military history. The museum has a complete set of Punch and Judy uh, theater with puppets and props. And some of you remember the Punch and Judy shows, I'm sure. Um, Anasquam was famous for them. Uh, the puppets are very much in need of conservation. Um, the museum also has all the original scripts and playbills and books about puppets that would make a very good exhibit in the future. And there's also a variety of antique dolls, doll clothes and furniture, and die-cast metal toys. In addition to the collection of cast metal vehicles, there are vintage games and game boards. I looked them up online and they're, they're from the early 1800s. Uh, Tom and I uh, were fantasizing about gathering all of the children's things in one place, including the school books, the school desks, the children's furniture, their toys, their costumes, their puppets and their games, and making, and making it into one uh, exhibit on the second floor. Because there is a lot of material there. And you have a very large collection of magnificent clothing from the Civil War era through the Edwardian era. And they're all, they're all in different stages of destruction and uh, infestation. Textile treasures includes the man's suit made of selvages of canvas from the making of the spirit of St. Louis. It's just hanging on the back of a door on a wire, on a wire uh, hanger. And maybe should be cleaned and hanging next to the spirit of St. Louis in the Smithsonian. Um, and then there are the cotton duck pants worn by Captain Oliver Lane aboard ship in the 1800s, also need to be cleaned and protected. On mannequins and on tabletops are fabric dresses and accessories that are rotting in place, and in some cases, merely touching them can lead to a cascade of shreds. And some things will not be able to be saved. Um, and there will have to be decisions about deaccessioning some items that are beyond repair. Textbook and book preservation uh, are very expensive, um, and so there need to be appraisals to determine what can or should be saved. These are, here's a, some beaver skin hats, a U.S. Naval officer's hat from the uh, late 18th century, and a U.S. World War I Army officer's hat. Then in steamer trunks and on a desk rack, desk, dress rack, there are handmade skirts and bodices with um, hand tatted lace and uh, in some cases elaborate beadwork. And most pieces are soiled and one trunk had worms. Tom crushed them between his fingernails. And so who knows, maybe we've solved the problem, maybe not. <laughs> Anyway, this particular bodice has uh, molded brass buttons and is definitely a Civil War era uh, piece. Um, it's just a few examples. There's more than enough clothing and fabric accessories to warrant appraisal by a textile conservator who could recommend archival storage or selective repair. And I understand from um, talking to the Leonard Club that there's also a collection of costumes in, uh, that the players used that is up in, in, the, in this building that maybe could be added uh, for appraisal. Um, there's a lot of money available for small museums. There's, uh, there are private foundations and there's local, state, and federal funding. Once the uh, Historical Society becomes a nonprofit organization, there would be funds for things like textile conservation. The museum has two cases with a special collection of ladies' fans. They need to be individually documented and researched 
cleaned, uh, properly displayed, and information about them should be published. Almost everything in that museum is information that is not available to the world that could be uh, published in, in articles. Um, and, the, and there would be people you know, interested in doing that. This, this particular fan has a mirror in the handle. I think you can see it. And this fan features a stuffed Baltimore Oriole. There's also a case containing a collection of beaded bags. In, in many cases, it's there, eight o'clock. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, computer. Um, in, in many cases, there's no record of who gave the item. Um, records were not kept, have not been kept for about 30 years, except you come across sometimes a thank you note saying, thank you so much for your donation. Um, but it doesn't say what it was they donated. Um, in other cases, we have a very exact list of exactly what was given and who gave it. This is provenance and um, having provenance and trying to correct the lack of provenance is critical in, in, um, you know, in a, for historians and, and conservators uh, because if it, something is completely worthless if you don't know how you, how you came by it, where it came from, who had it what they did with it, what it was used for, and so on. That's um, about the most important thing you can know about a uh, historical item. Tools and household objects and farm equipment. There's a, a, a lot of it. It's sort of jumbled and it kind of unsafe. I mean, you wouldn't want a, a child to, to be looking, trying to look at the material. For example, they might hurt themselves on the... So it needs to be culled and cleaned and labeled and reorganized for display. Tom and I could not even identify all of the objects. Um, some things we just could not figure out what they were for. This cobbler's kit very likely belonged to a sailor who made shoes in the winter when the fishing fleets were um, in port. This was a common winter activity for, for the sailors was shoemaking. Um, but, um, but there's no provenance for it so far. They're, they're, I've got the folders collected about this deep with letters and documents that still, they have to be gone through to see what we do have provenance for, what you do have provenance for. The museum has natural history collections, including this rare duck. I forget exactly why it's rare. It's a cross of, some, of two different breeds. Uh, and there are, are a couple of stuffed, other stuffed birds. Um, there's also collections of shells, tree woods, rocks and minerals, and other natural objects. And someone, maybe a, a scout troop, might be interested in putting together a case featuring the, featuring the natural history of Anasquam using items from the museum and other items. But there are items that should be removed that are hazardous. Uh, there's, um, there are samples of raw uranium ore. I'm tempted to take a Geiger counter in there. <laughs> and there are also some unused rounds of World War I a ammunition. And I'm tempted to not even touch them. So there's no security system in the museum and no, 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 uh, uh, no, no insurance, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> now this, this is, uh, you, you have some wonderful artifacts um, that are important and some are rare. You have both local and exotic Indian artifacts dating from the Paleolithic period, around 12,000 years ago, right through the contact period. These are quartz and rhyolite points um, that have been mounted on a board. I, I won't bore you with the technical names for them. And there are miniature pottery effigy containers that the Native Americans used in their religious practice to give offerings. They might put a pinch of tobacco, for example, in this uh, little pot that's in the shape of a uh, black bear's head and put it in a niche in the rock somewhere as an offering to the, to the spirit that that rock uh, represents. Those are very rare. 
S. Foster Damon dug these up in his backyard here in Anasquam at the head of Lobster Cove, which was the site of a native settlement. And this is what brought me here in the, in the first place, as I, as I mentioned. And I'd be happy to uh, develop an exhibit of, your, of those things and provide uh, explanations for them. The Algonquians were living in Goose Cove and Lobster Cove when the English first settled in Esquam, 1630s. And you have artifacts from all periods of occupation. On the left is a Paleo-Indian spear point. Uh, on the top right, you have an archaic ground stone axe. Uh, the little thing on the bottom is a, a woodland period uh, bird point made in jasper. And on the lower right is a contact period model birch bark canoe with quill work. There are also seven effigy heads in your museum. They have no provenance except that they were dug up in someone's yard, but they were not made by local Native Americans. They were snapped off from figurines in the royal tombs of Mayan kings somewhere in Central America, in Yucatan, Guatemala, or Ecuador. They were illegally bought or stolen by somebody who must later have been embarrassed and buried them in the backyard because that's where they were found. Uh, their origin is clear from that National Geographic article on the right. Um, I did a little bit of research. Again, not, I don't have, don't have too much time, uh, but I found out only one possible connection. There was a Fred Saville Jewett. He went to Harvard. He married a griffin. He lived in Anasquam. He visited Manabi, Ecuador, where his relative, Marshall Saville of Rockport, was conducting an archaeological dig of Mayan tombs in 1907 for the Hay, the Hay Foundation, the, uh, which is the uh, National Museum of the American Indian. And in fact, the, which is now the Smithsonian, really, um, the Smithsonian has, has the uh, bodies to these heads. And it, it may be maybe they can be reunited at some point. <laughs> it's something to consider. Colonial artifacts include the kaolin uh, clay pipes. These are imported. The one on the top is made as a Dutch-made acorn-style pipe, uh, early 17th century. And the pipe at the bottom is 18th century. These are homemade redwood drinking vessels. They have interior lead glaze, and they date to the 17th or early 18th century. It's very rare to find these whole, and it would be good to have a historical archaeologist, which I'm not, I'm prehistorical, um, or a ceramicist come to identify your artifacts that date to colonial times. Not just an antique dealer, but somebody that... Now, as you know, the museum has a, uh, was a firehouse, and there are leather buckets, cloth hoses, vintage fire helmets, photographs of firemen and their engines, and written records, handwritten records for when, from when the firehouse was operating. So reports of all the fires and all the calls that they answered. Um, the, the uh, Boston Firehouse Museum might know the history of the fire company here, Deluge 8, and they might be able to identify some of the firefighters that are in the photographs and might be able to explain some of the tools, the firefighters' tools that are there. And they also might want to acquire something from, from the collection because Deluge 8 originally was a Roxbury Firehouse, Roxbury Company. But that would make it also make an interesting exhibit for people to go to. The museum has miscellaneous pieces of period furniture. This desk belonged to the schoolmaster of the Leonard School in 1830. You also have old school bells, pupils, desks and chairs, slates, wall charts and textbooks, all of which could be brought together in a kind of Leonard School exhibit. And there you have the same potential uh, for an ex exhibits focusing on the village church. Many objects need to be researched to get more backstory. 
There are two spinning wheels, a rack of coat hangers for judges' robes that nobody knows why we have those, and a sea captain's portable writing desk. Special collections include uh, Roger and Mrs. Elliot's miniatures, uh, their baskets and ceramics, and there's a whole bookcase of them that they donated. These are very widely collected. Some pieces could be old or rare or otherwise valuable, and they should be appraised or at least identified, again, by a, a ceramicist or a researcher. And as it stands right now, visitors to the museum would have absolutely no idea what they're looking at. And the stagecoach is a special treasure. I think it should be restored so that people can sit in it. People could have their picture taken, maybe in period costume, using Martha Harvey's large format cameras or something, you know. The coach could also give fee-based tours to visitors and newlyweds in the summer times. And you would learn, earn enough from this coach to support the museum <laughs> and to support, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, two horses, the driver, the insurance, and the off-site storage in winter. <laughs> it would also free up a lot of space in the museum for special exhibits if you had somewhere to put that coach in the winter, in the winter time anyway. Somewhere, some, somewhere out there, there is a person who would get a lot of joy out of restoring this coach. A lot of joy. And there are many account books and papers and financial records relating to the history of the Village Hall Association and to all of Anasquam's organizations. The Yacht Club, the Village Players, the Village Church, all the village events like the Sea Fair. There are also piles of old newspapers referring to Anasquam's projects with the bridge, the lighthouse, the harbor. If the preservation of the history of Anasquam is going to be a goal of the Historical Society and Museum, then all of this material needs to be brought together and made presentable. This is sort of an overwhelming task. Uh, and there's, it needs to be broken up and prioritized and undertaken by different groups of people, both local and outsourced. And it should start with removing all the accumulated trash and things that are broken beyond repair and objects that um, the group decides to deaccession. Some things need to move upstairs, some downstairs. Some books can come here into the library. And some items need to be moved just in order to bring collections together so that you have like with like instead of some, you know, spread all over. And, and somebody needs to see if there's anything in the attic up in, over there, and I think they need a ladder for that. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> So someday the museum may have climate control, and then the rarest handwritten manuscripts and oldest glass plates uh, could come back and be available for study. Um, and the Cape Ann Museum has is, is agreed to help with some of those materials. And as I said, uh, there are a lot of funds available. There are also a lot of colleges and universities locally that have museum degrees in museum curatorship. Uh, or curatorial studies, whatever they call them, and their students all need projects. And so there's a possibility of getting interns here from that are learning about curatorial science who could help with some of these projects. So it's, um, <laughs> this is what I passed around at the, at the Leonard Club, and people, I actually did get people to sign up uh, to come and help with the, with the uh, I call it the muscle. <laughs> to come, Tom and I trying to move things is kind of funny, but you know, people come and, and move, take out the trash. We got as far as getting the purple garbage bags, <laughs> uh, and we don't have any recycle bins. But uh, um, so I'm not passing around a sign-up sheet this uh, this time. Um, but um, anybody that that would like to. Part, you know, contribute to the first thing, which is simply to fix it so that we can move around in there and make a place to work and get rid of the, the trash that has accumulated in there. That would be great. <laughs>